through us, O oh God, too. May your will be done here today, O oh Lord. May, may it be you that speaks through each one of us, O oh Lord, through everyone that comes up here, through Matt as he preaches, as we have different people coming here from different parts of the world, O oh God. We just pray that you would be here unifying us, O oh God. You would be here talking to each one of us. Amen. Consider your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in our sweet pain.
I were sitting in your seat right now, I would be hoping that there's going to be an awesome magic trick coming up. I'll just tell you, no, I'm not going to do a magic trick. So we've been looking through, uh, especially this, this sort of faith building friendship between the Apostle Paul and his sort of protege Timothy. And we're still looking at that today. And today we're going to talk about uh, addressing conflict and what some of that looks like. Paul wrote letters in the Bible, or letters that eventually went into the Bible to Timothy, and uh, he's in chains while he's writing. So that's part of the reason, there are various reasons, but part of this is to show you this is kind of what Paul was dealing with. Is he's in jail, in chains, and he's writing to Timothy all these various things, telling him things like, please don't uh, be ashamed of my chains, but be willing to suffer for the cause of Christ, be willing to be persecuted and go through that. So Paul is someone who, he's faced tough times in his life, and Paul wasn't afraid to get into conflicts. If you read through his story in the book of Acts and some of the other things in his letters, he's the kind of guy that at first was unafraid to share his opinion. He would have made a really good Dutch person, I think. So like, <laughs> I'm just going to let you know what I think. I disagree with you. And he, would, he disagreed with Christians at first, thought that what they were doing was wrong, and he wasn't afraid to try to change their mind, and when necessary, he would put people in chains, send them to jail, some of them were even killed. So he starts that very anti the message of Jesus, but then there's this moment where he's traveling on the road to Damascus, which just the short story is, hey, that's what we named our church after. But he's on the road to Damascus. His, he has an encounter with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, who's really alive, who's really there, and Paul changes his mind. And Paul changes, but he doesn't necessarily change in his conflict willingness to <laughs> look through. So he's more than happy now to go to someone like Peter, who's esteemed as a rock in the church, this guy who's like, Jesus has spent a whole lot of time with. And Paul's the type that will talk to this highly respected man and be like, uh, what you're doing is wrong, it's not the way of Jesus, and you need to stop. He's willing to talk to Barnabas, who was his sort of mentor, the one who had given him a chance, and had taken him with to start on some of this missionary stuff, and then Paul's later willing to tell Barnabas, um, the person you want to take with, John Mark? No, I'm not going with him. You have to choose between him or me. Uh, and since he's your nephew, you're probably going to pick him. So you know what? You can go your own way. I'll go mine. The man who's like invested in his life, Barnabas, and Paul's one to like, so what? But I got better things to do. Kind of reminded me or made me think of like, I don't know, a rock star who has a manager and like the manager that helped him get where he is. And he's like, I'm a rock star now. I don't need you, manager. Peace out. Paul continued with his being willing to have conflicts with people. As he goes around sharing the gospel, there are various times where he's getting beaten and stoned and all of that. But one of the earlier times as well is he is trying to share the gospel with Sergius Paulus, this guy who's a, an authority person. And then there's this Jewish false prophet sorcerer. And Paul says, looks at him and says, how long are you going to keep perverting the way of God? Uh, you're going to be blind for a little while. And it's just like, flat just says it in front of you, like, by the way, you're going to be blind. And he's, his eyes cloud over, and this guy is blind for a while. And it's interesting because Paul had faced sort of a similar thing. This, this road to Damascus story, when he meets Jesus, he was blinded and then humbled himself. We never really hear what happens with this sorcerer, Elymas, if he's blinded and then humbles himself as well or not. But we see that Paul is someone who's not one of those like, oh, I don't want to step on toes, I don't want conflicts. Paul was a very conflict person. At least started that way. And we see a bit of a change, though not a complete change, as he gets older. And that's sort of what I want to look at. We heard in the Bible reading from 2 Timothy 4. And I want to look at several of the people that are mentioned in some of those situations. And, and how Paul is trying to train Timothy and say, Hey, Timothy, you know this situation. This is how you should address this type of a conflict. So the first one I want to look at is this man, Alexander. Paul says, Alexander did a lot of harm to me. Be careful of him. Beware of him. We have to sort of piece together what was it that Alexander did. We're not told really, really clearly from things. 
This Alexander seems to be the same Alexander from 1 Timothy when Paul writes to Timothy and says, hey, there are some guys who have shipwrecked their faith and they're going the wrong way with that. And among them is Alexander. So by the next letter, it seems to make sense Alexander is still an issue. He might even be the Alexander that's still from Acts 19 that was in Ephesus that at that moment didn't seem to be doing anything wrong. He was, there was a riot going on and the crowd pushes Alexander to the front and says, hey, you explain this. So we don't really know more about Alexander than he's maybe that person in those two, if he is. He's someone who apparently was connected with the church, but then started going off on his own sort of teaching, what he thought was important, or maybe he was just trying to do the things that would keep him from being thrown in front of a rioting crowd again. Because not everyone who goes through persecution once is willing to go through it a second time. And that's realistic, and that's part of why I think it is good that we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are persecuted around the world, is that they will stay strong and they will stay faithful. Because it can be tough to face that once and then say, I don't know that I'm willing to do that again. Maybe that's the issue that's happening here with Alexander, we're not sure. But he's been called out by Paul at least once of, hey, this guy's teaching, not good, avoid that. So it's maybe not a surprise that Alexander doesn't have deep feelings for Paul, doesn't like him so much. And from the wording that we have, when he says, Alexander's done me a great deal of harm, it sounds like maybe Alexander was the person who informed on Paul to the, the police, the authorities. That way Paul's thrown in jail, and that's why he's on trial now. Because Paul is, is facing trial. He's telling Timothy, hey, come visit me. I'm here. And it might be Alexander who was the one who was sort of like the inside man who helped get Paul picked up. A uh, commentator, Barclay, wrote that informers were one of the great curses of Rome at this time. And it may well be that Alexander was a renegade Christian who went to the magistrates with false information against Paul, seeking to ruin him in the most dishonorable way. Possible we're not sure, but what I can say is this. Paul is willing to call out Alexander's name to Timothy and tell Timothy, avoid him. Stay away. There are some conflicts. Most often with our Christian ideal of like, oh, well, you need to be able to forgive people. It's going to be okay. You need to forgive people. I'm not saying don't forgive people. But in this case, Paul isn't saying, you know, he hurt me pretty bad, but maybe it's okay. Don't worry about it. He is saying uh, this man seems to be currently still very much uh, a concern. He's still dangerous. He's not changing his ways. He has no intention of doing so. He's dangerous. Be careful. Beware. Don't start to trust him. Don't put him in leadership. Don't give him some of those roles. This is still a real threat. And what Paul is doing is not, this isn't gossip, right? Because if you read through the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, he does say, beware of gossiping, beware of busybodies, beware of getting into all these offshoots of conversations that aren't important, right? So Paul knows to be careful of that, but he's saying this isn't just, oh, well, I heard from another person, from another person that he did this. Paul is able to speak from direct interaction with him. Say, Alexander has harmed me. He's not for me, and trust me, Timothy, he's not for you. Be careful. Now, in some of the conflict situations that you'll face, it's not wrong to be careful. It's not wrong to see um, there's a very real danger with this person. They're known for being aggressive. They're known for lying. And it's not just something that happened a few years ago. There's no repentance that's being seen. This person is out for themselves and not for the good of Christ's kingdom. So Timothy is warned. Beware. Be careful. And that's one of the things with conflict. He doesn't say, never talk to the man. But it's probably like if you can avoid talking to him, if you can avoid seeing him in this city, do it. Because that is causing problems. And he tells Timothy in 1 Timothy, okay, you not only do you need to know this, but you do need to warn others about his teaching. So it's not just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. There are steps that Timothy was supposed to take. But with that specific conflict, sometimes it isn't, well, you need to go to Alexander right now and tell him how wrong he is and see if you can change it. With that one, Paul says, 
avoid as possible. But there's a second group of people as well. When uh, he says that the first time I was brought before a judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. So we're just talking about like everyone category that, that Paul seems to make. Now, it does seem like he's a little overdoing it. Because he's just named some of these people ahead of time that we had in the reading. It was like, well, and so I sent this guy there, and that person had to go there. And some of them, it sounds like, well, he didn't abandon you. You said Luke is with you. It's not everyone, everyone. But you know those days when you feel like it's everyone? Everyone's against me. And like your spouse is like, I'm, I'm here. I'm not talking. I know, I know you, but like everyone. That seems a bit like what Paul is in. Just that general, everyone. I'm in chains for the cause of Christ. And all these other people who are supposed to have my back, all these other people who are supposed to be my brothers and sisters, supposed to be there for me, they all just abandoned me and left me alone. But Paul's encouragement to Timothy seems to be, Timothy, don't hold grudges in that. I, I overdid a bit of the, his saying it when he just says, like, everyone abandoned me. I hope God doesn't hold that against them. Depending upon your translation, it just says, God, please don't hold that against them. It's similar to when Jesus is being crucified. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Where Paul is saying, I'm not wanting to hold this against people. I'm not looking to start throwing this back in people's faces. And that's maybe something good for Timothy to get to hear, right? Because some people are willing to take offenses that are made against themselves. But if they see someone else being offended, like their, their friend or their brother or their sister, like, you can say whatever you want about me, but don't say that about my brother. And then, like, they take, they pull over that offense for themselves. And Paul is probably trying to tell somebody, don't, don't hold on to that. I'm not wanting you, yes, they all left me, but I'm not saying hold that against them. He's saying, God, I want them to be forgiven. And so Timothy, some of the everyone can just be the just in case, because you don't know who you're coming to. Uh, some of those, I'm not going to start naming names right now. Pontificus was against me, and Rachel didn't show up in my court hearing. Well, Bob and his friend was sick, so maybe he's okay. He doesn't get into each one of those. He just says, all these people that have left me, but don't go around holding that against them. Paul's at least saying, I'm not there to hold it against them. And that can be important, and that, that can be a difference. Well, what makes the difference between everybody who just doesn't show up and Alexander who is actively doing something to subvert the truth about Jesus and actively trying to stop other Christians. Well, you hear a bit of that, the, the passive versus the active, and I'm not saying it's good to just passively do bad things, but Paul's concern was really avoid someone who's actively trying to be hurtful. And with those that, for whatever their weakness was, were ashamed, were afraid of Paul. And maybe Paul slightly... A, Concerned that Timothy would be as well, and that's why he tells Timothy, don't be ashamed of my chains. Don't be ashamed of this, because Paul's seen it. He's actually been eye to eye with people who are ashamed of him, because he was a prisoner for Jesus' name. And instead of him being angry at them, he's, he's wanting them to be forgiven, and he does hope that they'll change. I've read a friend's Facebook post recently that said, a wise man was asked, what is anger? And he gave a beautiful answer. It's a punishment we give to ourselves for somebody else's mistake. And Paul seems to be trying not to do that. Don't take the side of anger. Other people made a mistake. They did something wrong. They left me alone. They, they acted dishonorably toward me. But I'm not going to keep punishing myself with the bitterness of that. I'm not going to keep punishing myself with the frustration of that. I'm letting that go. But he also doesn't tell him, oh, and find those people and make them not leaders in the church either. The last one that I want to look at is John Mark. And this one is where we see that people can change. And that can include you. 
Sometimes the assumptions you have will be wrong later. In the reading, Paul tells Timothy, bring John Mark with you when you come. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more of the history of that scenario. So back earlier, when Paul was younger, he was starting out as a missionary. Barnabas has taken him along. And they, Barnabas brought along his nephew as well, sort of like their, their helper, maybe third in command. We don't know exactly how that worked, but it's Paul and Barnabas and Mark who's helping them. But as they were going around doing their mission work, there came a moment where Mark ran away. We don't know if he like, ran away in the middle of the night or if he just told him to the face his guys, I'm going home. This isn't what we're, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going with you on the rest of this trip. There could be reasons for it, but Mark just left. Quit in the middle of the job. So then a few chapters later, after Paul and Barnabas have finished their first missionary journey, Barnabas says, hey, we should go around and visit those places that we went to again. And let's take Mark. Paul says, I love the idea. Let's go around and visit them. No, Mark. He ran away. No. He's not useful. He's not helpful. I'm not putting up with that again. And so there's enough of a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they go their separate ways, and Barnabas goes to one island where they went to, and then Paul actually goes around and does most of the visiting of the churches they've been to. But as Paul goes along, he takes Silas with them, and then he goes, oh, but you know what? Barnabas did have a good idea. There's this young man named Timothy. Timothy can be like my new Mark. Timothy can do this. Yeah, Timothy, you ride along and you help us out as we need. And so, to a degree, Timothy is kind of filling the place of the old Mark, right? So this gets interesting that by the time we get more than a decade along in his life, the, Paul is saying, hey, Timothy, so can you bring along Mark with you too? I don't know if you've ever had a job and like you were trying to get that raise and then you weren't given it and the other person was and the interactions you have with that other person. Like the, uh, oh, you brought in this other outsider instead of me. I've seen that happen in churches where it's like the pastor leaves, we want the associate pastor to become the next pastor, but they choose an outsider and then the associate pastor's like, but well, what about me? We don't know how that interaction went between Mark and Timothy, but I find it interesting. So we know that there was the time where Paul's like, no, don't walk Mark around. Uh -uh. And it's a big enough deal to me that I will ruin what has been my strongest friendship, the person who actually believed in me, over this Mark guy. Because Barnabas was the one who had pulled Paul in. Barnabas was the one who got others to start believing that instead of this angry Paul who's trying to kill Christians like he was earlier, that now he'd, he'd really changed. Barnabas was someone who believed that people could change. And he'd seen that and said, no, Paul is now really a brother in Christ. Let's take him. And he's doing the same with Mark. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. But later, I don't know exactly how it happened, but it seems like it starts to change. In some of the other letters that Paul and Timothy wrote together, in Colossians and in the book of Philemon, both of those say, Paul, an apostle of Christ, and Timothy, your brother, he's writing this to you. And in both of those, Mark starts getting mentioned. Of like, oh, and Mark's here, he sends his greetings as well. Or, and there's Mark, he's a co-worker. But by the time we get to 2 Timothy, which is the last of the letters that Paul is writing that we have recorded, he says, bring Mark because he's really useful to me. And when I looked at this yesterday, some of what struck me about it was the words that he used. That, oh, now, now uh, Mark, he's useful to me. He's no longer this useless little kid who runs away. But he's useful. Because there's another story of another person who ran away. The book of Philemon. We've spoken about it a time or two before, but Paul writes to this man who is a slave owner, a master, and his slave Onesimus had run away. Quit in the middle of the job and run off. Onesimus became a Christian. Very likely connected with Paul. Maybe Paul was the one preaching that, that had that change. But Onesimus and Paul become friends. And Paul says, you have to go back to your master and, and stitch some things up. I know that this looks like it's a conflict coming because it's going to be like, hey, what's up? I'm back. Here's a letter from Paul. Read that first before you have me wait. But Paul sends Philemon back. This is co-written with Timothy. Mark gets mentioned in it. But when he sends him back, he, he tells 
Philemon. I know, I understand what happened with Onesimus, and I know that he was a slave, and I know that he was useless to you because he ran off. But now, he's useful. And he's been very useful to me, I hope he'll be useful to you, or I hope you'll just set him free and send him back to me. You should treat him like a brother nonetheless. Paul's trying to be a peacemaker, but what was interesting to me, and really look at that, was the Paul who before saw Mark run away said, this guy's useless, I don't want him is the one who now learns to start standing up for someone else. It says, Onesimus ran away. Yeah, he was useless. I get it. But I want you to not give up on him. I want you to give him another chance. I think he deserves a second chance. Paul well, kind of started to learn that in God's kingdom, second chances can be worthwhile. And so then he uses that same word for, hey, this guy's useful. Maybe a few years later, when he's writing about Mark. And maybe he had a, like, oh, I don't know, maybe Timothy was there, like, so, Paul, you know how you said Onesimus was useful, he ran off, but, like, you were willing to be okay with that, because that didn't have to do with you, right? Like, Paul wasn't the one hurt when Onesimus ran away. And I get it, Mark ran away, you're hurt by that, but maybe you need to give him a second chance, too. Maybe he is more useful to you than you. We're not sure if that was the conversation. Very well might not have been. But Paul eventually writes about Mark. Oh, he's useful to me. So we have these two pictures of two people who ran away that both become useful. People can change. And that was Mark changing in part, but I think that was Paul changing as well. And when you face conflicts, that's one of the things for you to realize as you go along, right? Sometimes we hold stuff for years and years and years. And we don't allow for the fact that people can change. I don't know how many of you have like brothers or sisters who have ever been that way, but like there are times where between my sister and I, the way that we interact with each other is we're thinking that the other is going to respond like they did when they were 12 years old. And of course we're acting much more mature, but they're still acting like a 12 year old. You see the fault in that thinking. And that can happen as well in so many of our relationships. You've grown. You've moved on. That doesn't mean that you have to completely forget some of the stuff that happened. That doesn't mean that if the person's still very dangerous, like Alexander, that you shouldn't avoid them. But to give that opportunity to learn, to see that, to believe that people can change. Because that's something that Paul never forgot about himself. Because Paul was the one who changed first, right? Paul was a very dangerous man. He had people put in chains. He had people thrown in jail. He had people killed off. And did it out of a very intense hate and anger. He was a man that had emotions that were way off of the anger management scale. And he said, I, I know that I can change. I didn't forget that. And so some of the extra points. I just had, I think, like five extra points of what Paul writes to Timothy that I still have to go along with this idea of conflict. And one of those is, never forget that you've changed. So often when people are concerned about hypocrisy and judgmentalism, it's because they see people who maybe their lives have been changed, but then they, like, they forget that they were changed, and so they think that, oh, I've been all perfect the whole time. It's, no, you haven't. Those moments when your kids start to learn the things that you used to do as a kid, you're like, oh no, now they're going to realize I've been changed as well. Oh, so there was a moment, um, my parents were away on vacation one time, and I was driving their car, my dad's big truck, and it ended up getting a scrape on the side of it. Like, big scrape. And I knew my parents were on vacation, were wind up a uh, like, good time. And I'm, I have several days left before they return, and have that like moment of what do I do? Do I tell my parents? I'm, I don't think I'm going to be able to get this fixed before they get home. Do I just tell my parents on the phone? Oh, by the way, um, you truck. It just it's a little scratch because I know if I just say it's a little scratch and he can't see it, which this was before like. Skype and like, oh, let me show you. Like, if I say a little scratch, Dad's gonna be worried the whole time. Ruin the vacation. Don't do that. Wait till they get home. So they got home. I picked him up from the airport at night. It was dark. I'm like, I don't want to do this in the dark because again, I don't want his mind to start thinking. So I'll wait till the morning. Go have breakfast. And then say, Dad, I want to show you something. Your truck. But 
It wasn't that I wasn't supposed to be driving, but didn't have a good excuse for driving. So I started with my dad that morning. I was like, um, here we go. And he had one. I was like, okay, let me, let me think about this. We'll talk about it after I get home from work. Come on, after work. So like, this has been dragging up for days and days and days for me. I'm like, oh, it's going to happen to me. And when my dad got home, the thing that pretty much saved me from much, much worse trouble was he said, I know the stuff that I used to do when I was a cat. And comparatively, like I didn't grow up damaging or drinking or doing any of those things at all to the same degree that my dad had done. And then I'd heard those stories. I wasn't going to be like, uh, so dad, remember when you uh, did this? Remember when you did that? Because that's not the way to start with your parents. Don't try to be like, I remember you did something bad, so this is why this is okay. But God, thankfully, through his Holy Spirit, apparently spoke to my dad and reminded him of those. And my dad didn't forget. And so instead of it being like, I'm going to now not forgive you for what you're doing. Because he remembered his past. For those that have been a drum, you've been going through these parables of Jesus. And one of the really memorable parables is one called the parable of the unforgiving servant. The servant who has huge debt is brought before his master and deserves to be thrown in prison along with his whole family. And these debts are going to ruin them forever. The master forgives him. But then he goes out and finds another guy who has just a really little debt to him. And he's like, I'm never forgiving you. I'm going to make sure you get thrown in the debtor's prison. And we see how horrible of a situation that is. We go, that's totally not fair. You're given this huge debt that's forgiven, and you won't forgive something small. Remember, remember that you've been forgiven. That's important when you come into any sort of conflict thing. Paul warns him over and over and over. Timothy, try to avoid stupid and foolish arguments. Avoid arguments. Just get out of those. Yes, there are times where it's good to have a real discussion, but when you can tell the discussion is just going to an argument and you're not getting anywhere, avoid it. Or stop the argument. <clears throat> Another thing is just love the person that is disagreeing with you. In, in the middle of 2 Timothy chapter 2, this was one of the things I needed to learn a lot, especially as a teenager. I was just like, because I knew I could win arguments, I would get into arguments just to win them because it was that fun for me. I would sometimes even know I was wrong, and the fun part was to win the argument knowing I was wrong. Just so I could tell the person afterward, yeah, you're right, but I won anyway. It's not a good way to treat people. And Paul says, look, even when you're in an argument and you know that you're ready, the way that you're supposed to approach this is your desire is that the person will change their mind and will be set free from the stare of the evil one. He's saying those people, they're, they're stuck. They are chained in the wrong assumptions and the specific arguments that Paul and Timothy were talking about. He says those people, your desire is that they will come to their senses and avoid the snare of the devil. It's not so that you can be proud and win your argument. This isn't about getting another notch on your belt of winning an argument. Your desire is to actually love the person because you don't want them to continue being in chains. So remember that when you're in conflict. What is your end goal? And if your end goal is anything other than to actually love the people that you're arguing with, then probably step back and recenter yourself on loving like Jesus loved. Don't forget your past. Another thing is just be set apart for something better than arguments. Paul, a little bit before him saying, hey, avoid arguments, avoid getting into some of this stuff. He says, it's like when you have a house and you have some stuff that you use for like really honorable purposes. And then there are other things that you use for dishonorable purposes. You want to be that thing that's used for an honorable purpose. And that's close enough to some of these argument things that I think that might be part of what Paul is connecting with there. That he's saying, look, if you spend all of your time in arguments, is that really your purpose here? Is that the purpose of your life? Is just to be complaining and arguing and debating and disagreeing with everyone that you can come across? Instead, he says, Timothy, what you need to be able to do, yes, stand up for the truth, but focus on the truth part of that. 
Preach the gospel in season and out of season. Discharge your duties as an evangelist bringing good news to people. Have something better. I've told other people in the past that one of the things that I've needed to learn is that I don't want to give my best creativity to complaining. There's times when I'm arguing in my head with someone. They're not even there, but it's like going through, this is what I'm going to say, that's what they're going to say. There's so many better conversations I could have had in my head with myself instead of complaining and arguing and disagreeing with people. But that's something you have to somewhat choose. Do you set yourself apart for something better? Do you say, this is not an argument that's worth my time. This is not something, this is not a conflict that's worth getting into. Realistically, I still face this at times. This week, I'm setting the table. I'm trying to be helpful. And I asked my wife, oh, well, what, what are we supposed to put on the table? Uh, do you want bowls or plates or whatever? And she said to me, soup plates, which didn't make sense to me. I understood plates sh for sure, but the soup plate, what, what do you mean a soup plate? I don't put soup on a plate. So I'm like, a soup doesn't seem like the right word. I'm not sure what word she did use there. I asked once or twice. It still wasn't making sense. So I just grabbed plates to start putting on the table. She saw that they were plates and not this soup bowl that she was thinking of, or at least that's what I would call it. So there's this disagreement of things, and she's like, as I said five times, the soup plates. I'm like, I don't call them soup plates. These are not soup plates according to me. These are soup bowls. And she's like, these are like the soup bowls. These are soup plates. I'm like, these are normal bowls, and those are soup bowls. Do you see how that wasn't worth the energy and fight of it? And we resolved it quickly. It was fine. But it was one of those where I'm like, even a few minutes later, I'm just like, Ugh. they're not soup bowls. <laughs> those are just cereal bowls. It's by the and we can have those sorts of things where it's so easy to get distracted by stuff as meaningless as that. And other things that do seem more meaningful, whether that's I was trying to put together this presentation and the other student in the presentation isn't doing their job and you're getting arguments about how you're supposed to take the presentation. Any of those things can happen. But we set apart for something that's better. So my parents would say, choose your battle. And then put your life in God's hands. At the end of 2 Timothy 4, after he's gone through, hey, bring Mark with you. Everyone deserted me, but God, don't hold that against him. Alexander, he's harmful, so do watch out for him. Paul says, but the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. God rescued me from certain death, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heaven. All glory and honor to him. And so Paul keeps reminding himself, my life is not in the hands of even Alexander. He's trying to do harm to me. But he's not the one who's in charge of my life. God is. God has protected me this far. And his grace will bring me home. And so when you get into conflicts, when you're able to step back and say, God, you're the one who's in charge of my life. Not me trying to figure this out. And not the other people that are making trouble for me. I'm going to give you praise instead, and I'm going to look for you to protect me, to save me. I want you to be the one who, who solves my battles. But Alexander, he, someone, he said, look, God will pay Alexander back. Paul wasn't sitting in prison trying to scheme how he could get Alexander in trouble. And it wasn't, well, Alexander lied about me. I can find some people to go lie about him. Instead of him trying to solve it himself, he said, I, I leave that in God's hands. God's the God that will deal with Alexander, and he's the God that will deal with me. Your Timothy text. Um, each week I've been trying to give something, uh, a practical thing that you can do. So this one's more based off of that part of like John Mark. But look for something good in someone that you've written off. Someone that you've been like, no, they're out of my life because they're not worth my time. But look for something good in them and find a way to affirm that. That could be through writing them a letter, that could be giving them a compliment, that could be um, if you know that they're good at a certain job, maybe even trying to encourage someone to give them a job in that category, whatever that is. 
but, but find a way to sort of fight that conflict instead of going back to them saying, hey, yeah, you remember when you did this to me? Instead, seeing what is going well in their life uh, and trying to affirm that part of it. Just like Paul could say, hey, Mark is worthwhile to me, and Timothy, bring him with you. You guys should work together. One last thing. At the all-night prayer meeting that we had Friday night to Saturday, um, earlier in the day, I felt like God had told me, hey, look up Jeremiah 34 and read it. I was like, oh, okay. Not sure what that is. That, uh, I'll look it up. And I'd forgotten about it until we were in the prayer meeting. I went, oh, yeah, let's read Jeremiah 34. And it was a story that then I think connects with this in a way. At the time, God just says to the king of Israel, look, I had made in my law way back that you guys aren't supposed to hold on to slaves for long periods of time. And so that like, after six years of having someone a slave, the seventh year, you're supposed to set them free. That your way your brothers and sisters aren't kept in slavery. And, and the people of Israel over the centuries had not really been doing that. Until apparently they finally did under this king. In Jeremiah 34 we're told, oh you made a decree and people gave up their slaves. But the problem is, you all started taking them back. And God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is like, it, you set these people free, and then you started forcing the people who had been your slaves, that you gave up as slaves, to go back into being your slaves again. And then God says, because of that, I'm going to set you free. And what I mean by that is, I'm going to set you free to be put into bad situations for yourselves, because you're breaking that covenant of how you're treating other people. You're not loving the way I called you to. You're, you're totally doing this wrong. You're enslaving people again. And why I think that connects with today, I'm not saying it's specifically meant in this instance, in its case, but why I think that connects is I've seen a lot of people who forgiveness ends up being a longer process than just once. So like they get to a moment and say, yes, I'm supposed to forgive. I forgive that person. But especially when there are hurts that are really, really deep, sometimes you're like, forgive, it's great, I feel free, I feel fresh. And then whether that's a few weeks later, maybe that's years later, you're reminded of it, something brings it back, and you face that moment again where you're holding that anger against someone, where the bitterness starts to rise up again. And that can be a picture sort of like this, like you set them free, you forgave, but then now you're starting to put them back into your own dungeon of your life. God said, don't do that. In that moment, choose to set them free again. And so maybe that's for someone in specific or several people in this room. If you know that you're kind of starting to pick up some of those things that you had truly forgiven in the past, lay them down again. Set them free. Because being in chains is not what we're called to do. We're called to set people free, not continue enslaving them. And that includes enslaving them in, in our own eagerness, in our own frustrations, in our own bitterness. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you that you chose to send Jesus Christ to set us free. Thank you that when we were starting conflicts with you, that you chose to be the one who would end that conflict by sacrificing yourself. So I pray that we would follow the same example of Jesus Christ. To love others. To truly forgive as we've been forgiven. To have and see those moments where we're still called to tell people to change from the harmful things that they've been doing. But then to also see when you truly have been working in their lives, even without us, changing their lives, and that we would never give up on the fact that you, through your Holy Spirit, can change each one of us and can redeem the things that we thought were broken and destroyed. Thank you for being our Redeemer. And today, as, as we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in a moment, thank you for reminding us of how you dealt with that conflict and brought peace. In Jesus' name.
Uh, I just want to let, leave you guys with a message. God never places a challenge in front of you. He thinks it's too big for you to handle. No matter how big it looks, no matter how impossible it might seem, you've got what it takes to take on that obstacle. And if you just believe that, if you just, if you just go on, like take on that task, knowing that and having that in mind, that you've got what it takes to crush that obstacle down. Trust me, nothing will be impossible for you to do. Have a nice Sunday. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel. Um, I want to thank and praise God for, he's been awesome. Um, have you ever had that moment in your life, I, I try and call it the boom and bust cycle of life, or like the sine wave, everything seems to be awesome at some point of life, and the next moment everything seems to go downhill, and I had one of those episodes a few weeks ago. Um, things were not going really good in my work, personal life and stuff like that, and then I get a call from my mother who lives in India, my parents live in India, saying that she is admitted in the hospital and she needs to have this surgery and whatnot. So um, it sounded really complicated at that time, so by the grace of God I was able to take some time off from work, so I flew down back home and she had her surgery last week. And the surgery went really well, and she's out of the hospital, and uh, all thanks and praise to God, and thanks for Pastor Matt's prayers and, and the church's prayers. Um, so, and I also got a new job, so I start tomorrow, so please pray for me. Um, I
Every few years, people come into my life and never leave. Since I've, I've known myself, I, I've not many very friends, but the people that I have in my life, even though we see each other once every few years, they never leave. When we came to the Netherlands in January, um, we started to settle in and I told Riley that um, we need to go to church on a Sunday morning. I'm not sure if he didn't want to come, but he was dragging his feet. And I told him, let's rush, let's rush, let's rush. And then at long last when we left home, we were rushing, we were staying in Hulpen in temporary accommodation and so we rushed to church. And we got to the place, the GPS said, you have arrived. But we don't see a church, we don't see people. And there was no parking, so we can't get to church. I said, okay, let me look on the map. We find another church. Put on the map, it says that Damascus Road, International Church, and Mac, starts in 15 minutes. Just okay, put us in the GPS, we go to the next church. And as we, as we walked in here, we met, we met someone walking in, walking in with us. We said, ask, are you going to the church? The church, yes. He said, no, we we going to church. And this was uh, Nicolette. We walked in and she talked and she said, introduced herself. And we came and then we came to the service. We came in. And then the service came out. She said, no, you guys are invited for lunch. We're standing with Daniel and Daniel didn't know about the invite. So we looked. <laughs> she said, no, you guys are invited for lunch. And then lunchtime we went, they opened the doors for us, for, for me and my and my two boys. And I just want to say thank you that God used you to, to make us feel welcome. You opened your door, you opened your life for us in a time when it was difficult. Difficult for us as three guys coming to a foreign country without any friends, without any family. And you you open your life to us. And I, I just want to say thank you for God for giving us that opportunity with you. Thank you. Then sings my soul.